until the 21st of September in 2005, when the first newspaper article started to come out about catastrophic structural failure, I was the golden boy at LSU. And immediately that changed. And by, uh, by early November, I was being hauled over the carpet, told that it would be better if I quit talking to the media, and they were very straightforward. The reason being, you're hurting LSU's chances to get federal dollars. You know, I came back to Louisiana in uh, 1991 uh, to get involved in the Coastal Restoration Program, having done my master's and PhD here. And it very soon, very shortly thereafter, Hurricane Andrew came through and it made landfall at the best place you could ever hope for in Louisiana, where we had our healthiest wetlands. But it didn't take much to realize that if that, if that storm had come over a little bit more to the east, that there could have been serious impacts for Greater New Orleans or Homer and other communities. And so short from that, that point on, I really wanted to get more involved <coughs> in trying to understand the impacts of hurricanes on coastal Louisiana. I was very fortunate in uh, 1998 to be invited by LSU to go to Honduras, where I met Mark Levitan. And together, we, uh, it was really Mark's idea, but we, we uh, got the university interested in forming the LSU Hurricane Center. And that, in turn, gave me the platform to go over what I really wanted, and that was the funding to look at nuance, to really understand what the implications could be of a major hurricane strike hitting New Orleans. In order to do that, uh, we had to get the funding, and we were very fortunate to, be able to win a, a $3.5 million grant from the Louisiana Board of Regents through their Health Excellent Fund to set up a public health center. We had 16 uh, principal investigators, three different universities involved. We went from medical doctors to engineers to veterinarians, to landscape architects. And part of understanding the, the impacts of a hurricane was to develop a storm surge model. And with that, we reached out to the University of Notre Dame, who had a model that I had heard of that wasn't being used very much. And uh, over the next couple of years, we got that model operational here for Louisiana. So by the time Katrina arrived, we had a wealth of information and we were putting out uh, storm surge predictions. We'd worked very closely with the media for a number of years to try and get the understanding uh, that the, this, a major storm or even a close hit from a major storm could uh, flood large parts of the city. And I think we all remember the, 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 uh, the graphics that were in the Sunday morning uh, Times-Picayune the day before landfall that we now understand helped spur a lot of people to evacuate. Once the storm hit, uh, we literally broke off into uh, four different teams. There was uh, uh, the Board of Regents gave me permission to use my research dollars for support uh, work. Uh, we had a team come in and start water quality testing in the city with boats. Uh, we had another team that immediately moved down to the State Emergency Operations Center with all their equipment and started producing all the rescue maps, uh, mapping the 911 calls. Uh, Israel Boyd's here, he was one of that team. Uh, our record was uh, 89 people pulled out of their attics in one day uh, thanks to uh, those mapping those 911 calls. And uh, Mark Levitan was leading his group doing the wind damage assessment, and then a group of us started to try and understand the dynamics of what went wrong. And it became very clear to me very early on, in fact, Tuesday night, that what happened at 17th Street and London Avenue, which were the only breaches we knew, really knew of at that point in time, uh, the, those breaches hadn't occurred because the water had overtopped the levees. And I went to the governor's office on Tuesday night and said, I don't believe these levees failed because of the surge. And their response to me was, go find out. So that was the beginning of the charge that I had, given that I was being funded by the Board of Regents, the state agency, to go and find out. I then uh, got the opportunity to fly the area. I came back, produced a video, took it to the governor's office and said, here, here are the breaches. Have a look. There are 28 of them so far that we can count. 
And that was their first glimpse they had really had. And at that point, they said, uh, this was Terry Ryder, who was uh, Governor Blunker's right-hand person, said, I've got to make sure we don't drop the ball. We need to have our own investigation. And that led to the Team Louisiana investigation. We were first on the ground and uncovered a lot. Uh, we worked very closely with the group from Berkeley, uh, sharing a lot of information. And what's very gratifying to us on Team Louisiana is that we are now seeing many of our recommendations being implemented, from the closure of Mr. Go, the closure of the funnel, uh, starting to utilize pile supported structures, uh, and so on, uh, reliance more on, on, on uh, a lot of modeling. But unfortunately, all through this process, I was the, until the 21st of September in 2005, when the first newspaper article started to come out about catastrophic structural failure, I was the golden boy at LSU. And immediately that changed. And by, uh, by early November, I was being hauled over the carpet, told that it would be better if I quit talking to the media, and they were very straightforward. The reason being, you're hurting LSU's chances to get federal dollars. About the same time, Paul Kemp and I had been down to the Lower Ninth Ward, Dr. Paul Kemp, and, I mean, been to 17th Street, and on the way, while we were standing on the bridge, I asked him if he was ready for a big fight because I knew if we got into this, we were going to have a big fight and that we could lose our jobs. And Paul said he was. That, uh, that night I asked my wife if she was willing to take that chance of me losing my job uh, for us to do this. And she said she, it was fine. <coughs> well, you know, if, over the next few years, I just tried to hide underneath the, up, up, the administrator's radar as they continuously fired at me. They took away my right to teach, uh, which uh, to me is crazy. Why am I at a university? Uh, they started to tell me that service work has no, uh, no part in what I do, um, that the only thing that was important to them was research. For well, universities are three-legged stools. The one leg is service, the other is research, and the other is teaching. They then went to one-year contracts without any uh, discussion from myself. Uh, they then tried to get the faculty of my department to vote me out. That didn't work. And then ultimately, the only thing they could do was to terminate me. And what was very hard, and still very hard for me, is I don't know why. They told us it wasn't for economic reasons. It wasn't performance related. They didn't have to give us a reason. And so those two o'clock in the mornings when I wake up and uh, you know, ask myself, why? What, what, what did I do wrong? But the real victim in this is not myself. It's Mark Levitin. You know, he lost the Hurricane Center. He lost this wonderful entity that had been built at LSU to become internationally renowned and now it's dead. But the other important thing is, this suit's not about me. You know, I'll bounce back. This suit is partially about those people who, in New Orleans, overnight, through no fault of their own, lost their homes, all their possessions, their means of employment, and were moved off thousands of miles away. And for a while, I felt like we were the only voice that was there to be able to talk about their plight. And, and so, to some extent, the suit's about them. But the suit is also about the right of academics to be able to speak out. The right of academics to be able to follow the research where the research takes them. The right of individuals to be able to speak out. I came to America because of freedom of speech. It was one of the things that drew me here. And so I worry about students like Ezra. What is this going to be saying to them in the future if they find themselves in this sort of situation? Are they going to be willing to speak out? I've already heard colleagues at the LSU saying, I don't want to be involved in these issues because I don't want to lose my job. 
So this has sent a very chilling thing, signal to academics, I think, across the country, but especially here in Louisiana.